What is up, guys? Welcome back to another episode of the Meaning of Podcast. This is the podcast where we talk about your favorite film directors and the deeper meaning in their films. This week, we are doing a very special David Lowry episode, talking about The Green Knight, Eighth Body Saints, A Ghost Story, Pete's Dragon, Old Man and the Gun. We'll quickly kind of go all through these films because we don't want to keep you guys here all day. But I'm excited because I'm here with the crew, RB3 and Sabrina. But I'm even more excited because one of us just saw the green knight uh sabrina and i already saw it so that only leaves one left and that is you rb3 uh we were interested in hearing your takes for the last week so now that we have you here let's kick things off with rb3's thoughts on the green knight let him know bro what you think yeah i mean uh you know i'd be concise with it i i thought it was interesting you know i thought it was interesting i thought it was i thought i liked it a lot it's a good word it was definitely not what i uh it was not, a lot of ways not what i expected but in a lot of ways that was a good good thing you know subversive fantasy i thought it was uh very visually beautiful and i also thought it had some of the like y'all y- y'all like put me on to the magic of uh of dev patel and his and his performance in this movie and i absolutely agree i think he absolutely lights up the screen um, anytime he's on it. I think it's an interesting fantasy story that really tells the hero's journey story that we've become familiar with throughout fantasy, whether that's like Hercules, like King Arthur, like, um, like uh, you know, the Odyssey, um, and just like all kinds of hero journey stories that we've seen throughout history, but also subverts it enough uh, and plays with your expectations enough to where, you know, it keeps it it, it, it both grounds it in reality to a, a very heightened extent, but also subverts your expectations enough to where you're like, well, you might be expecting something at the end and you might not get that kind of payoff or satisfying ending. So um, that's that's where it was for me. I mean, I thought, you know, they left uh, an ending up to uh, ambiguity. And, yeah. you know, I guess we're going to be having to talk spoilers eventually. But, um, you, you know, uh, there's just a way that they end it uh, in an ambiguous way where it could lead to one path or it could lead to, to the other. And they chose to show us like one path that could lead. And if that's the path that we're left like an impression on of this character, yo, this dude is whack. I don't like this dude at all. Um, whatever his name is, Gilly had, Gilla, Gilla, Gwain. whatever his fate, Gawain, get this dude out of here. You're a clown ball, you're a goof. Because just because if that's like, if, if, if to me it felt like, dang, you took this whole journey, took this whole story, took this whole two hours to get to this point and you didn't realize the consequences of what you did like right if you would listen and and you know we're going to get into like i guess more plot elements but if you would have listened to what the challenge was to begin with he literally told you it could have been a, a, a scratch in the chest or you know whatever you could have taken an well, easy route and i don't know so it's just i was like, gonna say I, is sabrina and i are at the same page but did are you yes. thinking the opposite i think it's the opposite okay so it that's the whole thing is that i feel like typically in a film like we don't really spend too much time with characters that are just morally gray or things like that and so it's kind of weird because we are seeing this journey and there is a lot of growth so the way we're going to get into all this stuff, but the way I see the character of Gawain, I see him as somebody who, of course, he's King Arthur's nephew. So he's never really had his like place in the kingdom because as we're introduced to in the beginning, he hasn't really had that much interaction with his uncle. He's not, he's not a part of the kingdom in that way, just because of his lineage. And he's headstrong. He's all of these kind of things, a little bit reckless. As we see him, he's like drunk, going straight to this thing and he continues that so starting off in the beginning at this moment when the green knight comes in and has his challenge uh for everybody at like the table basically i see him as seeing an opportunity to be brave and be a hero and in that moment he's so caught up in his own stuff and he's so in his own head that he doesn't even pay attention to what it is because even if so even if he does listen when the Green Knight kneels in front of him, he it's just so easy to go like, all right, this is going to happen. And also, he probably didn't expect him to be able to survive. Obviously, this is a supernatural kind of like force of nature, basically. Um, I do really love the way that David Lowry um, and everybody working on this project, how they portrayed this character. Of course, he is like one with nature. His skin is literally bark. Um, but as far as Gawain... 
I just see him as somebody who's reckless, somebody who's never had to have responsibility or hold responsibility. So in this moment, he decides to have this big, this big moment of bravery. And that's not essentially who he is. So especially at the beginning, I think all of that goes down to the idea of toxic masculinity. So Mm -hmm. because of that, he wanted to seem like this huge, brave hero in this moment. And it just, it completely clouded his judgment and he didn't have, I guess, like very rational thoughts on what to do when this happens. Um, And so I find that to be interesting and like fascinating. And honestly, Dev Patel brings a really, like a really good boyish charm to all of this because even though he's making these mistakes, like I'm still rooting for him to do the right thing. And I don't want to get to the end because those that changes all throughout the story. He ma- he continues to make mistakes. He continues to has, have moments where he's brave. Um, but yeah, I think it's definitely a complex and like compelling character. And so I see your side of it as well. And I agree that he's all of these things and he's flawed, uh, but I don't see that as a negative thing. Wow, I think... I don't know how many, I don't know if you guys have read up on the movie or maybe if I misinterpreted, but I took the complete opposite from you, RB3. Uh, I I mean, again, it's like you said, ambiguous, it's ambiguity. So again, your interpretation can be just as legit as mine. Um, But I took it as like, he saw himself living this like facade life. And then at the end of it, when he took off the green band that's supposed to be of invincibility, uh, that he was like, I right, no cap, uh, well, but maybe I'm, I'm wrong. I'm only talking about the beginning. I'm not talking about the end yet because that gotcha. completely changed. Well, I mean, RB3, uh, yeah, because well, RB3, you mentioned the end, but that's how I saw it. I was like, oh, he went in thinking he could like fake his way through it. And then when he saw his entire life flash before his eyes, literally of like having this fake King life, he was like, fuck that. I'm going to do this for real. And he took off that shit and he's like, yo, yeah, off with my head, motherfucker, like straight up. Well, uh, that's how I saw it, but I, I might be wrong. I don't know. <laughs> well, I guess since we're already talking about it, um, yeah, I'll say yeah. That, yeah, I, I agree with you 100%. Um, yeah. I think he goes along this journey and he grows so much as a character because if we're just talking about the character of Gawain, I know we're going to start back off um, throughout this entire film, but of course he has this moment a whole year passes and he's literally in the same position that he was when we first met him. He's still just getting drunk, being reckless, getting into fights, doing all that kind of stuff. But people are talking about what he did and celebrating what he did. And they know he has to face his comeuppance basically Mm -hmm. in a year and that it's going to be, it's going to be this situation. So of course his mother giving him this thing to protect himself as he goes through, um, because to me in the end, he just gets his head chopped off. That's that's to me, that's what happens in the end. I know it is ambiguous and you can kind of come up with your own interpretation, but I think with the look in his eyes and that kind of like final shot that we do get, I just believe that that's the way that this ends because it's justified for this character. Unfortunately, he was able to grow as a person, but because of what he did before, he kind of has to face like the consequences of his actions. So he sees that life. And even though for a little bit, it is like high and mighty and he is king and he's doing things that obviously people would want, people would like dream of in that kingdom. Once he finally sees that entire sequence, which is absolutely beautiful. David Lowry did incredible work on that, but that entire sequence, he's very, very stern. He's hurting people that he cares about. He never even really cares about Alicia Vikander uh, her character, yes. he never yeah. even because even when she asked him, she's like, "Oh, would you want to make me your lady?" Before he goes on this quest, he's not really answering her. But then at the same time of not verbally talking about this kind of stuff, he did hold that bell fondly that she gave him. So yeah. that's why he's very much so on both ends, where he's kind of an idiot and he's kind of flawed, but his heart is almost in the right place. He just kind of has to find his way throughout this journey. And so the fact that we go through this whole sequence and he's completely stern, clearly very unhappy. And then the ending is what it is for him. Yeah. And taking off the bell in his head. In that moment, because right before we saw him going like, like freaking out and crying. And then at the end of it, he's literally like, all right, let's do it. And he takes it off and he's like, yo, no cat straight up. No fake kinks here. Yo, if I die, I'm a legend. <laughs> exactly. Like straight up. That's how I saw it. I saw it like, what does it take to be a legend, right? And it's like that idea of like, 
I don't know, back to the future where it's like, bro, if I can wear like a bulletproof vest in this time period, people are going to think I'm bulletproof. Right. Um, but he wears that magic belt and he realized like, even if I did get my head chopped off with this magic belt and my head didn't get chopped off and I came back and I would have been like, yo, I went head to head with the green knight and he couldn't kill me. You still know you kind of cheated because you use cheat codes. Uh, like in a video game, you were just like, yeah, I used the cheat codes to get to the final journey uh, and to face the final boss to, to survive, but I didn't really win it. I didn't earn it. And then when he takes it off at the end, when he sees himself, like when he's an old man and his head rolls off, I see that as like him realizing, like I could live this fake life as like a fake ass king, but it, it's straight up the most depressing ass shit ever. Yeah. And I won't get any fulfillment. I'd rather die right here, right now. Like I'm a die a legend, like straight up, exactly. like they told me to. And, and like my mom and the King and King Arthur and everyone told me to, to face up with the green knight, whatever happens, happens, then I'm gonna do it. And I'm gonna do it the right way, which is going out with like no fear, no cap, no fakeness um, and no magic power cheat code. Uh, that's how I saw it. And I was just like, yo, that's kind of dope. It's kind of like a hip hop song where he's just like, yo, straight up legend from like, if you're reading this is too late, shout out to Drake. <laughs> well, I don't know. He was like, I don't know he was like that, oh but... my God, oh my God, if I die, I'm a legend. And I was like, oh shit, that's exactly it. <laughs> And well, I, that's he straight, funny. Up, well, he straight well, up said like no fake king bro he was like i'm a fake ass king and it sucks and he was like almost on the verge of tears like throughout that entire sequence and then it kind of dawned on him he was like yeah that would be a shitty ass life to be a fake ass king i rather i mean of course out, but i mean but that's the but to me i mean to me that's the life that like he was headed down anyway you know and i guess i guess the belt to me to me the belt i guess the belt might have been like actually protective of his life i don't know yeah, to me the belt was because when he took it off his head rolled off so i was like oh well so he yeah. did protect him yeah. because but it's, I mean, it's like an enchanted belt and they said no yeah. being no harm, or anything yeah. could hurt him no harm will come to him when he's wearing this he doesn't even take it off uh like with his like new wife so mm -hmm. yeah yeah but i mean that's what but that's what I mean, that's what in the fact, yeah, of course, like in the imaginary version of what happens to him, like in the future, but and the over the course of the movie, like, we don't know if it's like actually magical or not, right? Like, before that moment. No. So to me, I felt like the belt was more of a connection to Alicia Vikander and like his like connection to her or whatever. Because isn't he like, because she has it to him in the beginning, right? Like, she's the one who like, no, the, his mom. the mother. Well, the mom. Okay, but also the mom. Okay, what's up with the mom and cursing her own son to to this I whole think, thing anyway? So the, my interpretation. Correct me if I'm wrong, Sabrina, because I'll pass it to you. <laughs> I, I thought that either the mom either called the Green Knight or either um, created the Green Knight. I wasn't sure if called or created. Maybe called in order for him to become a legend, right? So I thought her thinking was like, you know, that scene with King Arthur, and he's like, "What do you see?" And he's like, "I see legends." Um, and then when he turns around and then his mom calls the green knight, I thought the mom was thinking, oh, if my son takes down this motherfucking demon knight, then he's going to be a legend. So I'm going to give him this. I'm going to call this demon knight, give him this super magical belt so he can beat him. So when he comes back, nothing's going to happen to him no matter what. So he'll be like the most badass king in the history of kings. Because also, he, again, this that's how I saw it. Well, this wasn't going to like this didn't have to lead to death he made that decision himself so him saying like oh you could just scratch me on the arm and i'll return that blow yeah. and so he made the decision himself to cut off the head which like meant his own death and i honestly do feel like the conclusion is one that is completely earned and i think it feels very very fitting to the atmosphere and the tone that david lowry set i think we have the character growth because he's deciding like like andre said to like die a legend and everybody's going to be talking about him. People are already talking about him in the town. They were uh, something that I absolutely loved. And I talked about in my review was the way they showed the passage of time, especially in like the first and the first half of like the second act when they had the marionette puppets and they were telling the story as it was happening and they were showing all the moments they showed him cutting off the green knight's head and those kids are watching it. And that kind of displays how this story is going to continue to be told and passed down throughout this kingdom. So would you rather end your life and have this big, heroic, brave moment where you put your life on the line and you step up to a challenge that nobody else was ready to, even though it ends in your own demise or 
fail as a king and be remembered that way and be unhappy the entire time. So I feel like it makes sense. Um, I, I knew the second I walked out of the theater that it was going to be divisive, but I loved every single thing about this movie, every single step of the way until we even got to the end. I just thought it wrapped it up so beautifully, um, being open to interpretations while also having such a fitting closeout because finally he is able to actually be rational, rational and reasonable for once. And even if whether the belt is magical or not, it's basically a crutch for him where he thinks this is going to be the case and he's not going to get hurt. So it is a really big moment that he kind of, he pulls it out himself and he's just, he's just ready. And it, ending with a, like off with your head. I love it. I, I loved a lot of the dialogue. Um, even one of the times when the green knight was about to swing his ax and he's like, all right, let's get to hacking and just different things like that. I just find it to be so funny. And I, I think this is really interesting. And also I haven't seen anything. Um, I'm not crazy familiar with Arthurian legends, but I haven't seen an adaptation quite like this. I just find this to be so beautiful and moody and cerebral in all these different ways. And I think that's what makes this stand out um, from any other Arthurian adaptations, but also even David Lowry's filmog filmography himself. True. Yeah, it's very metaphorical. It's very much like the challenges he faces, the people he encounters are like metaphors along the way to discover either failures, like you guys said, where it's like his weaknesses or maybe success um, when it comes to just being you know, in the moment. Um, like the Winifred scene, which is probably my favorite scene in the whole movie. Um, it's a good one. Because I thought it was hysterical. I thought it was like a little comedy where she starts like floating towards him. And and he's like, are you? Uh, and she's like, what are you doing? What do you, don't touch me. And he's like, and she talks about her head and she's like, I'm, I just need my head, bro. Like, can you just help me out? And he's like, I don't get it. But he's, she's like, there's nothing to get. I just need my head. <laughs> I just thought that was a funny moment. And I thought um, Aaron, Aaron Killiman was great in that scene. And I don't know. I just thought it was a an interesting journey of like manhood, of being a knight, of being great. Um, like that scene with Alicia Vikander right before he takes off, he says, she says, like, what do you what do you want? He says, I want greatness. And she's like, what's wrong with goodness? Like, why do you need to be great? And he's like, nah, I'm trying to be the goat, I'm trying to be MJ. Um, and that shows like how like headstrong he is yeah. and how ambitious he is without doing anything up until this point, he hasn't done anything. So this moment was big, but at the same time, it's like, he's defining his character through this quest and the people that he meets along the way, they're challenging him in ways that the green Knight doesn't, you know, like he, he knows he's going to meet his demise at this point, even when he asks and he's like, is this all there is like, is this the only option? Um, but yeah, I, I just found a lot of that to be so fascinating. And even like a lot of the side characters, because the first person that we meet on this journey is a uh, Barry, Barry Keegan, I believe his name is pronounced. And he's, he's the, uh, the highwayman. Like he's the guy that's just like walking around in like the rubbish and ends up, uh, <laughs> scheming his way. And it's just really, really interesting. I just, all, all the, all the ways that they kind of test him. Um, I find it to be so beautiful and also like the cinematography and like the landscape of this quest. I feel like all, all of the things like the grass, his, his yellow jacket, his chain, uh, I don't know what that's called, like a chain armor. Chain um, yeah, it just, it's so vibrant and it feels so like lived in. And I, that's why I feel like we're on this journey too, throughout everything, even like the low moments, even when it might seem a little bit dull, I still feel like, you know, everything on screen was alive and I was kind of like encapsulated in that. RB3, uh, you keep nodding and smiling. I want to hear what you're thinking, bro. No, it's it's nothing. I just realized, and this is I'm, I might even just cut this out, but I just realized I'm a supreme hater, you know. So <laughs> as the more positive things y'all are saying, the more hate comes to my mind, and that's really oh, not really? the right attitude I want to I want to bring to this because I do really like this movie. Um, I do think it is, like y'all said, brilliant, beautiful, a subversive like the fantasy score, tale. Score, score is great. Um, yeah, I don't know. I just, uh, I guess maybe I, I, maybe I just wasn't following his character closely enough. Maybe I know sure. too many like frat boys in my life who like fell upwards mm. a lot of their life. And I just hate mm. seeing them become like, 
you know, become, you know, whatever legendary status, something like that. But I felt like this is what even though. But, I was I mean, gonna say, like, that's the thing. Like, at the end of the movie, if it did go that original ending, then I would have agreed. But the fact that he did choose, kind of like, yo, I'm just gonna go down, go down swinging. Yeah, uh, he chose. He chose the option. He laid his own bed for that, though. You know what I mean? And I know, like, but it's still like it's still like low key. Like that's yeah, that's what he. Yeah. If it was like a frat boy, he would have been like fake ass king. You know, sitting well, on I the throne and why... getting his wife and doing whatever. Yeah, he, he starts as he starts as the frat boy, and he doesn't. Yeah do the frat yeah. boy move. But I still think like, you know, dang, all you gotta do is like, cause to me, it's like, yeah. if I what's the, where's the, where's the, where's the story? And again, score, hater, score 50 hater to game six, bro. That's hater, all you gotta hate, do. Hater stuff right here. Hater stuff. Where's the story about the guy who makes the choice to just cut the green out on the wrist, uh, goes through this whole journey and ends up, uh, still, I don't know. To me, like, to me, it's like, we see the story enough about like the arrogant guy, you know, wants to be a hero, wants to be that. And he ultimately like, doesn't really do that much. Like he doesn't ultimately avoid that much temptation. He just, he has tried a lot. He does go through a lot of trials. Like he is robbed by the kids. He is, you know, uh, he does go through the whole spirit, you know, with the spirits helps and, the spirit, and yeah. yeah, all that stuff. Um, I definitely thought that stuff was cool, but at the end of the day, like he's mostly just doing like good Samaritan, like yeah. activities. You know what I mean? Like, it's not like, I don't know. To me, it's like he but just, that's he's... the point, right? Yeah, you think? I guess. I don't know. It's not. I, I guess. Yeah, it's not my type because of... I, I thought the yeah, Winifred scene, in... the the Winifred scene to me spoke about um, spoke about exactly what he asked the uh, the guy who was asking for money um, on the side of the road who ended up robbing him because it spoke to him like this. His whole journey is about getting power, getting clout, getting greatness, getting status symbol becoming a legend becoming a goat and then in that scene he literally is like there's no one here there's no one around he even says to to winifred he's like what do i get in return and she's like what just my head that's it like it's literally just for him and her there's no other person looking or watching there's no show or audience it's him knowing he did a good deed for a spirit who just wanted her head back who got mistreated in her life um and, and again, it's one of those unbelievable tales that, again, even if he does tell that tale, it's like, who's going to believe him? Because it's so bizarre and unbelievable, but it's just for him. It's a personal connection for himself to realize, like, oh, I have the capacity to do a good deed without requiring something in return, which is why I thought that was interesting when he said, what do I get back? And she's like, nothing, just my head. Um, so, And that's why I think Dev Patel is, like, the perfect person for this role because he has, he's able to like embody that arrogance, but he's also able to embody that like vulnerability. And I think if it was anybody else, it just wouldn't work as well. I, Lowry, uh, he kind of spoke about how he was going to make the character completely irredeemable by the end of the film. But then Dev Patel kind of shaped the character a little bit with him to give him those kind of moments where an ending like this one felt earned and it isn't just like, oh, this like douchebag is going to be a legend because he did help other people throughout his journey and chose not to go the route where he was going to hurt so much, so many other people in his life. Because he didn't, even if he's arrogant, even if he's all of this kind of stuff, like headstrong, he's not necessarily actively hurting people. He's just kind of lost and doesn't have his own place in the kingdom. Um, but I, I think it's really important to talk about that, like struggle with like masculinity, the struggle at this time, the struggle, like now, I feel like that's a, that's a relevant topic. It's that he kind of tosses all of this other stuff to the side to seem better and stronger than anybody else. Um, in times where he's not, and he is afraid and he's able to also, uh, portray that just like very well. And I feel, I feel like if any of us were in this situation, it would be scary. Like I would never, I would never go on this type of journey, but doing it with him and because of the shortcomings that he does have mm. with his personality and just like his spirit and his heart, I feel like, uh, this journey was essential to his life. And yeah. Yeah. RB3, what are your, uh, what are your final takeaways, man? Yeah, I mean, I thought it was cool. It's interesting you say that, Sabrina, like, you know, the director kind of originally wanted him to be irredeemable. I think to me, like, I think I still feel that innateness in a little bit just through the sensibilities of how I feel like uh, a lot of the film was framing him up to be. I mean, 
he was getting like hero shots even while he was getting drunk and like laid out and laying out in brothels you know what i mean he was he was always kind of proclaimed to be this hero because that's what his personality is um but you know and even although the camera movement and the style eventually starts to change as the movie like goes on he still you know he still i mean to me again i again again maybe i'm just like this is just some hater stuff but again maybe i see like something where he helps home 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 girl the spirit get uh the head out of the water not necessarily as like uh a moment for helping the spirit but more, maybe just for a moment of helping himself a moment of getting more information of, of moving forward or of like you know of, of his own personal curiosity i mean that's that's personally where my brain goes because that's where the framework of the character just begins with and you know he he does show hints of generosity throughout other places of the film but i think Ultimately, he, you know, he he does fall for some temptation, for some level of temptation towards the end. Uh, whether that's for, um, um, for the for the wife, for the wife, for both the lady, the, the lady, and um, but I guess you know, I don't know. I guess I guess I would need y'all help. So maybe explaining also what was uh, the Joe Legerton's character and uh, that relationship uh, because that was interesting as well. Toxic um, relationships, but, bro. Gotta yeah. avoid it. Yeah. That's so what he I, learned in that moment. He was like, well, hell he no. Said, I, yeah. I saw it in theaters twice. And the second time I saw it, like the first time I saw it, I got the gist of it. But the second viewing did give me a whole different outlook because I was able to see a lot of things and a lot of moments, things in the background that I didn't pick up on the first time. So like before he has the interaction with like the giants and stuff like that, there is a large rib cage in the back, like in the middle of the hills so it's just all these little things that are like alluding to what is going to come next. And I think with Joel Edgerton, he has this moment with him that he's talking to him and he's like, um, anything that you get here, like you have to like also give it to me. So it, it is very, very confusing. Um, and I think that's why all of this is kind of like open for interpretation. I would respect anyone's opinion on it. But that's why like when he kisses him, it's like he got that from Alicia Vikander yeah. so is he saying like also because he said like how can I give you like what could I give you that you don't already have mm. and it's like that <laughs> you know like it's, it's see, all that, these little things but the, to yeah. me it's like that's what Tom Cruise probably does at like every party you know what I mean like to me that's a power move like just getting to kiss whoever you want to kiss move how you want to move <laughs> like you know uh right before you get slain like that's that's some dope stuff man like he's 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 getting his his whole life story right in front of him before before he gets See, to gets I don't to know how down, you can so. read it like that when he goes like he's like sprinting away from the castle like freaking the hell out uh I don't know that's just I because I took that entire scene as more as him just like encountering temptations and reading people and realizing that the people who seem like super noble and super kind might be kind of dickish might be kind of assholey kind of like Joel Edgerton's uh, but right true. before that, when yeah. he was talking to the fox, the fox never talked to him back, but he was just <laughs> like, I'm going to be kind to this little fox creature who keeps following me around. And then he discovers that Joel Edgerton's character is a hunter who like viciously hunts animals. And he, he starts to realize like, oh shit, like this guy's not that great. His, his wife is just over here, just testing me. Looks just like the freaking girl that I used to go out with. Um, yeah. I thought it was more like a like a challenge, like a test. Like, hey, these people mm -hmm. seem cool, but they're kind of kind of sketch. I'm I'm a dip out, and he starts yeah. and he dipped out, and he was like, I'm just gonna sit in the chapel <laughs> and wait for the green knight to wake up rather than to stay here. And that's yeah. how I felt like that scene was because he realized, like, wait a minute, these people are just toxic. Hashtag yeah. no toxic relationships. Well, I think the second that he starts to go on his journey, I basically think that he embarks on into the green chapel and that could be from yeah. like the landscapes and everything it all embodies it we even have the moment with Alicia Vikander when she's talking about green and how green is overpowering and it's going to outlive us and it's going to grow from us and all these different things and we're going to be fully in green um like I mentioned earlier with Barry Barry Keoghan um he said, he's like, oh, did where's the green chapel actually? Because he, he was going to give him directions. And then he said, you're in it. So from the moment that they rob him, he told him, he's like, you're in the green chapel right now. Yeah, so I like think that, 
yeah, that entire journey and all of those moments are tests that ultimately relate to that. So it's like every single step is something that he has to do that changes himself and challenges himself. So yes, helping Winifred, I don't believe because he was just going to run out and he was actually very kind when she caught him in the room. He's like, oh, I'm so sorry, miss. He's like looking away and he's running out of the house. And he's like, I didn't know anybody was here. So every single moment was a different type of challenge that he had to get through to ultimately get to the end because by the time he got to the end that's when he realizes like okay I am a changed person every single level changes him a little bit differently and so that's why I think all these side characters have such a even if it's smaller scenes I think they have such a profound impact so yeah there's like that temptation from the lady there's helping this person out there's just even the drive to continue forward because at any point in this he could have turned back but because he already uh did this challenge like he he has this urge to finish it so each each step of the way is definitely confusing but I think the second he embarks on the journey once he crosses that threshold uh, with all the dead bodies and stuff like that, it's like he's in the challenge and each portion is just a certain challenge to lead to the bigger one, which is his own death. Yeah, to me, I felt like the whole thing was kind of like a setup, right? Where it's someone says, hey, man, you know, I'm going to set this crazy scenario up where I'm going to give you a bulletproof vest or something like that. And then some guy's going to shoot you. And when you get up, everyone's going to be like, yo, what a legend, what a badass. And, and he did. And his mom set it up where it's like the guy was shooting him. He gave him the vest, but he took off the vest. And he's like, nah, F that. I'm, if I'm going to go out, I'm not going to go out cheating and be this fake, you know, hero who everyone thinks, you know, faced up against the Green Knight when in reality I cheated. Um, but I bet so to before... me, it is like the hero's journey as far as like realizing and learning and what is what does it mean to even be a good person or a good dude yeah and before so. all of the quests that's probably something he could have easily done he could have easily yeah. like kept kept the enchanted belt whether it's enchanted or not is up to interpretation um, but he could have kept that on he could have ran away he could have done all of that but each step uh brought him like closer to accepting basically his fate kind of yeah kind of breaking the mold breaking the rule of like being a, a, a legend only in setup, like a staged hero instead of like a real hero who would actually give his life and not come back with all these crazy stories and be like, yo, look what I did. And then eventually not, not live a fulfilled life, which is why that Alicia Vikander scene is really important because he takes his son and gets married to like this, the whitest chick ever. Um, uh and, and it's like that scene of like, I don't, I, I didn't earn this. This is in my life. Like, it's almost like he's re rejecting that and realizing like, yeah, I'm supposed to be king. I'm supposed to be this stuff because I faced off against this green knight when in reality it's fake. You know what? I know I'm supposed to be king, but F it. I'm gonna go down swinging. I'm just gonna go down the way it was supposed to be. Um, so I don't know, that's how I took it. And I was just like, that's kind of cool. Um, but there's another film that David Lowry has that is also uh, kind of fantastical, not quite as fantastical, but it is one of your favorites, RB3, Pete's Dragon. Uh, talk to me a little bit about Pete's Dragon. Yeah, Pete's Dragon is a, is a 2016 film that I really enjoy. It's a remake of the 1977 film with the same name from Disney um, Pictures. Uh, when the original came out, it was both a live action. It was already... It, it, the, this live action remake of this Disney movie differs from the other ones because uh, the first Peach Dragon, the one that's it, it's remaking, was actually already live action. It just had the animated dragon. Pete was the animated feature. So in this time, it, it kind of is readapting that same style, except you know the animation is like made to look like more photorealistic. Um, but at the same time, you know they have like this photorealistic, quote unquote, photorealistic dragon. But they make a lot of creative choices to make them like super adorable. Like they have like fur instead of scales, and they make them like super adorable and cuddly. And then he has like a very expressive face. It's not like Lion King where they're like animals and you know they don't, you don't really like know any expressions that they're making um where this one like he has a very expressive very like buoyant face and it is easily communicated what the the dragon feels and ultimately I really did enjoy this one and 
um, for many of the same reasons why I enjoyed this, the the Green Knight is the visual aesthetic of it, the pacing of it. Um, we didn't really talk too much about the background of uh, David Lowry himself, but he actually comes from an editing background. So, and that's something you could definitely tell from his films because there's a very meticulous kind of pacing that you can see that's like, you know, consistent through his uh, film work. Um, there's a lot of slow, it's very slow, very rhythmic, very, um, you know, some people I've read in reviews uh, call it like poetic. Um, and I think that's very true because uh, there's a lot of, I personally feel like throughout his filmography, there's a lot of room to breathe, um, a, a lot of longer takes, uh, a lot of um, scenes that uh, would typically run a lot shorter in a conventional film. Um, but uh, he, uh, and of, when we talk to a ghost story, uh, that's definitely a movie that definitely goes into that extensively. Um, but scenes that would typically take uh, a normal film goer out of their comfortable rhythm, but he still finds a way to execute them in, in very like easily digestible ways. And I think Peace Dragon is like a very commercially like friendly version of that. Like, you know, it's kind of like the Disney. I also feel like it's very, like it's almost like the anti, this came out in 2016. And it's almost like the same year that, it was the same year that the Jungle Book came out. But I almost feel like they're like the same ends of like the opposite spectrums almost. Like they're like, uh, or opposite ends of the same spectrum, I'm sorry, where the Jungle Book is like highly CGI, fake environments, like no humans except for Mowgli, um, and like all talking animals. This movie is like only one real like kind of fantastical element and one CGI element, which is the dragon, mostly practical, all in nature, um, with a bunch of humans. And it's pretty much exclusively about a human story. So I like that it's grounded in reality. I like that it's a story that feels real, feels natural. It's something that it can can relate to more people just on the fact that it is real. And it doesn't have to be a dragon. It could be a dog. It could be a cat. It could be whatever kind of pet uh, you want it to be. So I really dug it. Uh, I really dug Peace Dragon for sure. I, I love the fact that you mentioned the Lion King because that was the first thing that came to my mind. The fact that this was made like two years before and this dragon is emoting. I am so personally and emotionally attached to this dragon and it's incredible how they do it in this one, but that's completely left out of something like the lion King. Um, I thought this was absolutely incredible. I think this is one of my favorite Disney live action because I don't really vibe with them, but I also have never seen the original peach dragon. So this is my first time kind of diving into a story like this. And I think that for everything that you said, RB3, I 100% agree with. I think Lowry has a certain pace and like a methodical approach that he does like spend so much time and it is so patient. But at the same time, his films have a pretty short runtime. Most of them are about an hour and a half. This one's an hour, 40 minutes. The Green Knight aside, because that one's over two hours. But you typically, they're pretty concise, but at the same time, he's able to explore so much story, so much heart, so much emotion, even more than some filmmakers do in two hours and 30 minutes. So I think um, this film is such a good one for him to take on. And I know that he's doing the Peter Pan and Wendy. I think he's writing that one, uh, possibly writing and directing. I don't know. But him tackling this kid's story, I absolutely loved it. I thought that um, the themes and the ideas and the emotion that he brings out just worked really well for a film like this um, because I didn't think that I would be as emotionally attached to everybody as I was. Yeah, it's kind of incredible, RB3, kind of going back on your take as well about his pacing. His pacing is insane. I love it. It's actually one of my favorite parts of his work is the idea of just letting it breathe, letting the scene mm -hmm. breathe, letting the moment breathe, letting it all sink in. And I mean, really sink in, which I think is the best part of a lot of his films. And I think that that's kind of where uh, obviously, The Green Knight does it well. Pete's Dragon does it well, too, considering it is a much more commercial film. It is a Disney film and a shorter film. Um, but yeah, I, I love his style of letting uh, moments be there. Because again, you guys know me. I am, I hate, hate rapid cuts. I hate rushed editing that makes you feel like they're just like, let's go, let's go, let's go, let's go, let's go, let's go. Come on, come on, get to the final, get to the And I'm just like, dude, chill the F out. Let me see who this character is, what the story is. Let me just look at him. Let me just let the moment breathe. And I think David Lowry is really good at that. But yeah, I just think it's interesting the way he's able to tackle indie films and, 
you know, big budget Disney films. And I think, like you just said, Sabrina, he's doing another one, right? With Peter Pan and Wendy. It's like, this guy is insane. He can really do, um, what is he, what does he call it? Um, one for you, one for them. Uh, where it's the idea but that they're like both for him because sure, sure. he's knocking it out of the park. He is absolutely not phoning it in by no, any means. And they're good it's, films. It's absolutely great. And I love that you mentioned like saying that it's like lived in genuinely. We spend enough time with all of these characters and all of our surroundings that we're completely immersed in it. Whereas a film that has all those quick edits and quick cuts and things like that, you don't have that same feeling that it just like feels like a world that you can breathe in. And also he accomplishes more this way, much more than like the quick editing that feels so rushed. And yeah, 100%. I agree with that. Before we go to break, I kind of want to hear your guys' thoughts on what you guys would like to see him do next. What kind of film, what specific film, what kind of genre, uh, what kind of story, whatever it is, it could be super specific. It could be very general. Uh, but what kind of work would you like to see David Lowry do next? And then we'll go to break. I'll start with you, Sabrina. I honestly would love to see him take on like a biopic. Um, I think it would be so cool if we have, because I know he did The Old Man and the Gun, which we're going to be talking about, that is based off of like a book and a real person. Um, but I think maybe like a really, really prominent figure whether it's like a writer, a director, or actor, something like that, I feel like he's able to portray so much emotionally in a lot of the shots and scenes that he has. Um, so I think bringing having a filmmaker like that adds and lends so much to the story because in some of those, you can feel the weight of the emotions, but other films like that, you can't. But I think he's somebody that can do a really, really good job of that. And then it kind of goes away from... Um, like you know like supernatural or like fantastical films even though i love when he does stuff like this as well um i think it would be really cool if he kind of took on like a grounded biopic of some sorts what about you obi3 i would like to see him uh do something in the science fiction realm uh personally uh just because i think he has such a grounded style and i think even with the green knight is the most grounded one of the most grounded fantasy films i've seen like in a long time same with um, Peace Dragon is the most, I feel like the most grounded Disney uh, live action film. Like there's almost no, there's not too many action scenes besides the end and the budget's only 65 million. So I would like to see more of that. Like I would like to see more of a grounded, emotional, Denny Villeneuve arrival kind of sci-fi. Uh, you know, it's very grounded in reality from, from, from David Lowry. Yeah, I was looking up uh, budgets because you got me thinking about budgets. Man, I wonder what, the budget was for this movie. I can't believe I didn't look that up. Oh my God, is that real? I just Googled it right now. 15 million for the Green Knight? How is that possible? That's like the same budget as Hereditary. <laughs> How the hell? Uh, that's gotta be cap, yes, right? Conservative that's cap. stuff, man. They got that's a cap. smart filmmaking is uh, doing it for cheap. Doing it for cheap. <laughs> that's incredible. I'm blown away. This is like the biggest indie film I've ever seen. I mean, because um, like they shot on location, like in Dublin yeah. and stuff. And it's yeah. it just shows it is so and much. And those costumes better don't look see. cheap. Yeah, practical stuff, like beautiful, beautiful costumes. I think wow. like they should totally get nominated for costume and they're like, gonna get they should get nominated for a lot of things. Costumes, yeah. they should win for costumes, in my opinion. Uh, but cinematography, score, yes. all that shit should be up there. Even acting. I, I would give it to Dev. I would give Dev a nod. Oh, At least right now. I, I said that earlier. He's already a lock for my one of my nominations for the you Cuddy did say Awards. That. I remember that. Yeah. Yeah, 100%. Um, can I be honest with you guys? You guys are going to scoff at me, laugh at me, roll your eyes. <laughs> uh, can I see uh, David Lowry? Attack on Titan, please. <laughs> when I saw the scene where he sees the Titans, I'm like, Titans, it's the Titans. Uh, even though they were giants, but that's about the size they are in Attack on Titan. But I really do feel like Attack on Titan has that kind of vibe of like very slow pace, extremely slow pace. Like Ben and I have talked about it, Ben Goddard, um, about how, how it's so deliberately paced, so slow and so peaceful, but it's so heady and so cerebral like Attack on Titan is. Uh, and it reminded me a lot of like the Green Knight um, in certain scenes where I was like, it is kind of like a period piece where this is like, you know, Attack on Titan's like 1700s, 1800s. Um, but either way, 
I was like, bro, this guy would kill it. And plus, we already have the Titans. By the way, we never mentioned that scene in Green Knight where he's where he sees the Giants and he's not freaking out. He just goes, hey, can I get a ride on your shoulder? <laughs> he literally mushrooms. says that. He's on the mushrooms. That's why. I, was, I know, but I was like, bro, he sees Giants, like literally like skyscrapers. And he's like, hey, can I get a ride on your shoulder? I just thought that was so funny. I, hey, I'm mushroom taking mushroom behavior. That, no, yeah, I'm taking that stuff literally. We saw the rib oh, yeah, cage. Real giants, these, bro. Yeah, these, these exist. Also, yeah, if you're living in this time period, you haven't discovered a lot of stuff. We still, there's stuff in the ocean. We have not discovered that in real life. If I stumbled <laughs> upon something crazy in the ocean, I'd be like, yep, that, that checks out. Me too. Imagine bro. like only exploring a certain region and like yeah. the Green Knight just came in and acted the way he did, survived getting his head chopped off. By that point, I would no believe one, anything. No one questioned anything. They were just like, yeah, I know this guy. That's that one dude. <laughs> Yeah. Uh, all righty, guys, let's go to break. After the break, we're going to be talking about Ghost Story, Old Man and the Gun, and uh, there's one more Ain't Body Saints. Uh, so make sure you guys stick around. This ain't funny, so don't you dare laugh. With the 450 divide you in half, you getting at me equals a club pass. You do the math, take you out the equation. This ain't funny, so don't you dare laugh. Speaking on David Lowry and The Green Knight, have you seen Sabrina's review of the new A24 movie available exclusively on First Cut? If you haven't, here's a clip. Enjoy. From mesmerizing visuals, haunting score, David Lowry's poetic storytelling, I think it takes the viewer on a journey themselves and you truly get a chance to live and breathe in this world. Every shot and step of the way is crucial for this interpretation. It captures and reels you into the dreamlike voyage of a character's evolution. Rarely are we introduced to or really get to spend that much time with such a complex protagonist. And I think Dev Patel fully embodies Gawain through all of these flaws and ultimately we continue to root for him. And it provides such interesting outlook and conversation and that's why I am giving the Green Knight a 9 out of 10. Come along, children. Now we're going to have a little music. What is up, guys? We're back talking about David Lowry's films. Now we're doing our second half, which is talking about Inked and Body Saints, Old Man and the Gun, but especially a ghost story. Um, for anyone who doesn't know, A Ghost Story has a very special place in my heart. I saw this film and I lost it. Uh, I absolutely loved it. It's one of my favorite films of all time. I've said that many times. I have it in my letterbox top four. Uh, you know that letterbox thing y'all use that? Yeah. Uh, where it says rank your movies or whatever, like some of your favorite movies. And that's up there for me. I put it up there. Um, it's just one of those films, man. One of those films. I've, I've talked to you a lot about this, Sabrina, but talk to me a little bit about why you love ghost story. Ooh, this was the first film I ever saw from David Lowry. And I was absolutely blown away. Um, when I started the podcast with you guys, I kind of talked about how, like, I'm a huge fan of like Noah Baumbach. Like I love very dialogue heavy, uh, screenplays and I love films like that. And this was the first time that I really saw, um, a film that has such little dialogue, but says so much at the same time. And just like, portray so much. And so like, I feel the biggest wave of emotions whenever I want to feel anything. And I know oh, I can guarantee to watch a movie that's going to make me feel all these different emotions. I put this one on. I think this one is absolutely incredible. I love the way that they show like the future, the past, like the passage of time, life, love, loss, um, and just celebrating all of that in a very like bleak and dreary, but also slightly uplifting way. Um, it's kind of has this, this thing of you're never really gone. None of us are ever really gone, um, because we live through the people that we've loved and we live through all the moments I'm sitting, I know I'm getting too much right now, but I'm like, I'm sitting right here right now. And I'm probably going to move out of this apartment when my lease is over. And, but there's always going to be a time that I held this spot and everywhere we go. Um, that's kind of the way that I feel about this film. Uh, it, it just genuinely brings me so much joy, whether it's Rooney Mara putting notes in the cracks of all the homes, um, that she moved to when she was a kid. And she continues to do it with the, the home that they have in this film, whether it's that, or even just Casey Affleck being in a sheet and walking around. It's just like, you're never really gone. There are pieces and fragments of you everywhere, no matter what. And I don't know, I just love stuff like that. 
I uh, I see RB3 smile as soon as you say that because we all know RB3 is a massive fan of this film as well. Uh, talk to me a little about a ghost story, RB3, and why it didn't really connect with you. Well, I no, I just you know it's it's not it's not the, any particular father of the film itself. I think it's just more uh, it's a me thing, you know. Uh, it's not my cup of tea. Uh, I think it just moves. You know, for me personally, I just you know I don't I. I'm, I have, you know, I have sadness in my life. I'm depressed in my life. Like, I don't need to experience that through film, personally. I mean, and you like a lot of depressing right films, so. I do. I definitely do. I definitely do. I definitely do. But, I, you know, sometimes, you know, you got to... I don't want to say nothing, like, deflammatory towards the movie because, it's you know, it's excellent to a lot of people and it connects with a lot of people. So, you know, to me, it's just not that, you know, entertaining, per se. So, I yeah, there's not much for me, like, to... to, yeah. to Sometimes if it's a depressing movie like Requiem for a Dream or, you know, something that's like, style, you know, has a little energy to it. But, you know, for me, it just wasn't, again, nothing, nothing against people who like it. And it's just my, not, not my personal style of movie. That being said, too, I want to go back and, you know, we we're talking about the Green Knight in the first half. And I'm sure 90% of our podcast listeners are going to say I was hating on it, I'm not hating on it. I like that movie a whole lot. I love that movie actually. And I just, you know, I, you know, I think when I get a little confused about something or when I don't understand something, I probably like react like a little more negatively than I should. I think with the go with a ghost story, maybe that's it. Like maybe I don't understand any of the emotions that's going on in this movie. Uh, maybe I don't understand like the kind of like I understand grief and tragedy and loss, but maybe I don't understand it on the same level with a partner, with a long term relationship, with somebody who with Rooney Mar, who's been lonely for her entire life. Um, and had that person who she was like relying on, yeah. um, and and had that and have that loss too. That's a very that's a very tough and very challenging. And maybe that's not a, a an emotion I could personally connect with. And that's maybe why it didn't move me as much. So I don't know, you know. Yeah, grief is such an interesting thing to capture on film because we've seen it many times on film. I just love the way it's done in this film because it is shown as I don't even know, Sabrina. It's shown as like. It's such a range of emotions and just memories and and how you can always grieve like eternally, uh, even though you're still moving on, because we obviously get that scene where Rooney Mara eventually does move on. And Casey Affleck is looking on in his bed sheet like, yo, what the hell? Um, but at the same time, it's one of those things where it's like time is supposed to heal. Right. But at the same time, time is is one of those things that'll make you remember, make you keep yourself in check. Um, and it goes back to the scene where it's like the only talking scene in the movie uh, where it does that huge monologue with Kesha. Shout out to Kesha. Mm -hmm. um, but essentially it's that scene where they explain like, you know, memories and thoughts and heritage and lineage and passing yourself on. Uh, through different people and that kind of sticking with you forever. It's super existential. Uh, but I really love, we talked about pacing beforehand in the first half, but my God, the pacing of this movie is perfect. I love it. I love how slow it is. I love how it's just a shot and just a couch for like 30 seconds. <laughs> uh, or even honestly, one of my favorite scenes in the whole movie that a lot of people I think was like made fun of on film Twitter for quite a while. I don't know if you guys remember this, but the, with the Rooney Mara pie scene, uh, was like a troll, you know, funny scene for a lot of film Twitter. But for me, I was like, fuck, I felt every second of that. I felt every bite. I felt every, I'm telling you, I, I literally felt like I was on the verge of tears. I felt it. Yeah. I felt the pain, bro. Uh, yeah. just imagine just being alone and just, you know, feeling so much grief and just don't not knowing what to do and just kind of just sitting there and just dealing with it and not cutting away and not being like, all right, next to the action scene. Like it just yeah, felt like it's intimate and uncomfortable yeah. to sit yeah. there and just feel it with her. And obviously we can't like, we're not grieving him, but we're, it, it feels like we are with her. Like we are grieving him, even though we don't know him. <laughs> Yeah, again, these are just these are just uh again, just not my my sensibility. <laughs> but um but you know, I very much I applaud it. I I I get the bravery, I see the bravery, I acknowledge it, and it's definitely there. It's just wasn't for me personally. Um and I think there are a lot of great, like, you know, older films, you know, experimental foreign films. Um I always pronounce my homeboy's name wrong, but Andre Trulkovsky. 
Hopefully I got it right mm-hmm. that time. Um, ha, you know, has a very kind of uh, not sim- not similar style, but also I think that's something that we could also talk about with David Lowry too. You know, sometimes his film work has uh, sometimes adapt styles of, 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 of other filmmakers. Uh, and I think with, you know, um, Anthem Body Saints feels very Terrence Malicky. I think this one feels very Trunkowski. Uh, and the, and the way of the aspect ratio and a lot of the still shots and a lot of the ways the camera moved, you know, horizontally, um, horizontal, right. That's the left to right. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Um, and the, slowly. The, and slowly. Yeah, exactly. And I think we see some inspirations and, and, and stuff like that from that. And I think this is definitely fitting in that same vein of cinema, um, just, you know, through an American lens, which is great. Uh, and this just wasn't my personal cup of tea. Yeah. Totally and I understand. Yeah, I completely, I completely get that. To me, this is the most like cinematic and cerebral that I've ever seen, like the exploration of grief and life. Um, but I, I totally understand. I didn't even think it was going to be my cup of tea at all. Uh, and I just, I really, really vibed with it. And this is one that I rewatch a lot. Yeah, I, I really do feel like it's, it's a special movie for me just because of how much it represents uh, how much it communicates without saying anything, like you said, Sabrina. Yeah. Uh, I think that's kind of the best way to describe it, how it is kind of a silent film, but how much the score communicates uh, emotion, right? Because score does communicate emotion, but when you combine score with moving images, you have something that's kind of different, right? It's more like a painting than anything else because yeah. you're trying to find and discover uh, emotion through slow moving images, which is kind of what you do when you're at an art gallery or something. Um, but along even, with the score, it just makes it even better. Well, even like having our our protagonist, I guess, having our protagonist be covered in a sheet for basically the entire film, but for some reason you feel so much emotion. Like another scene that I absolutely love that for some reason just shatters my heart um, is when we have Casey Affleck's ghost and we have another ghost looking on through the window and they see each other. And the other ghost is like, they're saying hi to each other. And then he's like, I'm waiting for someone. And then Casey Affleck is like, who? And then the other ghost is like, I don't remember. And then just kind of like looks off. It has like a, a movement and it's it expresses so much emotion without having that at all because it's just a sheet with two eye holes in it. Yeah, it's, it's so fascinating how he's able to convey that much emotion mm-hmm. just through that image. But it's such a... a it's such a memorable image because of what our connection is through it usually, which is uh, in, a, in a comedy sense, right? Or at least in a, in a childlike sense yeah. uh, and, and imagining that childlike nature inside of uh, a death, right? I mean, that's kind of what the movie is about is about death and life and kind of coming back together, which is when we meet that little kid too, who's later on in the film, that's another um, establishing connection that he has to like new life, which is that kid uh, in the house who's living there after Rooney Mara, I believe, um, mm-hmm. which is really interesting. Uh, I love this film. I think I could talk about it forever. Uh, it's one of those movies that just will live inside me. Um, but there's other movies that we have to talk about. So let's get right to it. RB3, you wanted to talk about this movie more than anyone else. Uh, talk to me a little about uh, Ain't the Body Saints, man. Yeah, Ain't the Body Saints. This is one of, uh, this is his, if I'm not mistaken, this is, might be his debut feature. If it's not his like absolute debut feature, maybe there's like a documentary or something in there, or a smaller thing. But I think this is the one that definitely, certainly at least, I think put him on, a, on a, uh, the map for a lot of people. Um, and it stars Casey Affleck again. Uh, so he can, you know, he's getting his, you know, he got his little, his guy's little bag, his little people he likes to work with, Rooney Mara, of course, as well. Um, and Ben Foster as a supporting character. And this is all, um, and it's, you know, it debuted at the Sundance Film Festival in 2013 and actually won the Best Cinematography Award uh, that year. And the cinematographer of this movie is actually uh, somebody who we love here, Br- uh, Bradford Young, uh, the wonderful DP uh, behind, of course, Arrival and uh, a lot of uh, amazing films. Um, so anyway. Cool. Oh yes, Solo, Solo, of course, too. Um, Solo's uh, amazing. It's beautifully yeah. shot. That's yeah. one of the best parts of the film. Absolutely, Salma too. Salma as well. A, a beautiful year. Um, so yeah, it's very. Uh, so I love. I like this movie a lot because it feels like a. Very, it feels very much like a modern western. Um, I know a lot of people have take have spoken about it taking inspiration from 
like Badlands, like the 19, you know, 70s, like Terrence Malick movie. Um, and I could definitely see a little bit of that influence in terms of like the criminal outlaw of the two of these two characters kind of living on the outskirts of society um, while, you know, still like this intense romance filled with like these beautiful, gorgeous, like outdoor shots, landscape shots, like um, it has a very like naturalistic style to it. Um, so I do really like it. I think it has a voice. I think it's special and unique. Um, I also think it's a good like crime film and action film too. So um, yeah, overall, I really, uh, I really dig this movie. Yeah, Sabrina, give me your thoughts on this one. Yeah, I really, really like this one. I think um, coming, this is like his first major feature. Obviously, I don't know if he's done other like smaller things in the past as well. But um, coming out the gate with this one, I find it to be so interesting because I only had watched it. It was one of the last films I watched in his filmography. So I went through the ghost story, Peach Dragon, all of that before I even got to this film. And it's not what I expected at all. I didn't even, I didn't even check all of this. He manages to tackle so many different uh, tones and kind of like genres, like RB3 said, romance, crime, Western. We have this 1970s Bonnie and Clyde type of relationship with Rooney Mara and uh, Casey Affleck. And I think he does a really good job of like tackling all of this. But then again, just like having so much emotion at the core of every single one of his films, it is just so much emotion, so much heart, so much warmth pain everything and he's able to do this in like an hour and a half and it, it just boggles my mind uh as a filmmaker to express as much as he does in the short run times and how patient he is with all of these stories and i love that rb3 also mentioned like terrence malick uh 100 get all of that and i think he did all of that justice yeah um it's interesting because we never well we kind of did with Dev patel but his performances david Lowry gets in all his movies are kind of remarkable right obviously rooney mara uh in a ghost story but all uh casey affleck in this one even uh, bryce what, dallas howard and peach bryce, dragon yeah i mean how do you guys feel about his uh his actor direction kind of connection that he has considering he does get so many amazing performances how do you feel about that rb3 specifically with this one um, yeah, I mean, I think he, I think that's part of the appeal of what, uh, what we see, especially with an actor like Ben Foster. I feel like Ben Foster is a very underrated actor. Um, I think whenever he pops up with something, especially something like Hell or High Water, which we saw him in a few years later, but there's like a good predecessor to this where he's a character who is playing, like, you know, we have uh, obviously the um, F Casey Affleck, who's like the husband uh, and, or not the husband, but the, you know, Melanie relationship and, um, Rooney Mara, who's, you know, the partner, um, and she shoots the officer that ends up getting Casey Affleck direct, uh, arrested, but Casey just takes the rap for it. But ultimately, Ben Foster's character, um, ultimately Ben Foster's character ends up developing a relationship with her while, you know, uh, dude's in prison. So it's like, it's like there's a little bit of conflicting emotions there. Like you would normally think Ben Foster could totally play this as like a bad guy, as an evil dude, as like an evil cop or whatever. Or it could be some sort of compassionate, like softy. And it, it kind of rides on a little bit of both. It rides on a little bit of both. And I think it's it gives you a little bit of, it gives you definitely favors more towards Rooney Mara's perspective, I think. But also at the same time, it like, uh, and favors the romance between Rooney Mara and Casey Affleck's characters a lot more. But I think it still gives you a lot more balance with the like quote unquote antagonist, you know? Yeah, I mean, it's truly remarkable what he's able to get out of his actors. I think it's amazing considering, uh, like I said before, I think Rooney Mara's performance in A Ghost Story is incredible. Obviously her performance in this is amazing too. She's just a really good actress too, but considering that David Lowry is able to get the best out of these actors is kind of amazing. Speaking of actors that are amazing and that are in David Lowry's films, Robert Redford in The Old Man and the Gun. Uh, it's technically his last movie because Robert Redford is an older gentleman, uh, been around for a while. He's one of he's the, the titular old man. He's, he he kind of <laughs> is, but he's also like he's like one of the most. I don't want to say influential, but kind of one of the most influential actors when it comes to modern cinema, at least when it comes to uh, indie movies and independent movies and Sundance movies and Oscar movies. Uh, I believe he's one of the one of the pioneers of Sundance, right? Every three or am I wrong? Yeah, he, he was one of the founders of Sundance. Yeah. Absolutely. So so this is kind of a, a really interesting journey, but I also like how David Lowry spams the spectrum going from kids movie to like surreal, trippy 
uh, life and death existential movie to like um, The Green Knight, which is another like mix of like, you know, transition type movie to like old old people movie. <laughs> Uh, no offense, uh, but it's kind of, there's a lot of old people in this movie. Um, how do you guys feel about this movie and how do you feel like it delivered? Because it kind of went quietly. I don't know if you guys, you know, followed David as long as I have. But if you guys were following along with this when it premiered, it was just like, yeah, it came out. You know, Robert Redford is in it. And that's kind of all I heard from it as far as people's conversation around it. But what do you guys think of this movie, uh, Sabrina? Yeah, it was nominated for a Golden Globe um, for Robert Redford. And I like it did get a lot of praise. I know critics really, really loved it. But this is one of those films that is just not going to be something huge. And obviously, this is the second time Robert Redford has worked with uh, David Lowry, first time being Peach Dragon. And it's just really cool to see a story like this. It's really cool to have an actor as accomplished as Robert Redford be able to end his career on a film like this because it is genuinely hilarious there's, it's like, it's thrilling. There's emotional moments again with this one, a lot of crime and it's based off of a real life person and adapted from a book. So this is different because David Lowry typically writes his own screenplays, um, but having a different body of work kind of uh, with uh, The Green Knight as well, even though that was a poem and he took a lot of liberties, but still stuck close to the source material. This one, he is straight up adapting from a book. And um, I just really, really enjoyed this one. It's because I like all of his films, this is probably the one I'm going to like rewatch the least, but it is still a really, really fun ride. Again, dealing with another crappy protagonist or like morally gray protagonist. And that's what I find to be fascinating. And with his last two films is that he's tackling something that's that complex. Yeah, no, I, I love what he's able to accomplish with Robert Redford, considering it's considered to be one of the greatest actors, right? At least one of the best actors that we know. Uh, RB3, what are your thoughts on this movie? Uh, I'm be real with you, and, uh, you know, I didn't, I didn't see this one all the way through. Oh, so, shit. Uh, yeah, yeah, <laughs> you, yeah. You but, an ageist, bro? You ageist? Yeah, you know, I see an old man in the movie. You I see just, an old just, dude, you see an old lady, you're like, all right, I'm out. Yeah, this guy sees skip. No, I'm just kidding. Uh, but no, I, I, I'm not ageist. I, I love old people. Uh, but I, I just, I just didn't catch this one all the way through. But I do apply Robert Redford still doing it. Uh, I like that he could say well, that. Not that. Well, I mean, he, he's still. I mean, come on, he's still alive though. Um, yeah. But and and um, I, I do like the fact that he can say that the last film he acted in was like the super nice, you know, art piece from David Lowry, yeah. Old Man the Gun. Good for and then, David, right? And then yeah, and then the last, but then the last, you know, movie he like showed up in on screen is uh avengers endgame which yes. is one of the highest grossing movies of all time so he kind of yeah. he got both he got the indie and the and the biggest black the biggest too. movie yeah. ever yeah yeah Endgame yeah. is the biggest movie ever it still is uh I that's think wild a, avatar, I think avatar might have passed it it did again. Yeah. Oh, they did a re-release so, uh when they true. started opening up overseas. yeah right but also <laughs> endgame did do a re-release as well and that's how yeah. they crossed the mark they did exactly. a re-release shortly after the original release but I mean, speaking of Robert Redford, Sissy Spacek as well, super, super accomplished actress, mm. obviously mm. most known for like Carrie, but she has so many accolades. Uh, she's definitely like, she's spanned such an entirely uh, interesting career and she's still going right now. She's still announced for other projects. I just saw that she's wow. going to be a part of another Stephen King adaptation. I think it might be a TV show. I can't remember. Um, but yeah having these two actors together, I think was so awesome. Genuinely, the second that they meet each other and him living the life and giving a fake name and basically just picking her up to evade the cops, almost it's just like, oh no, I didn't just rob a bank. I'm here driving with my lady. Uh, and then the cops just go right past him and he lies to her, but then immediately just has this connection with her that is so electric and palpable. Um, their chemistry is through the roof and he's able to just, not lie and he tells everything he's like yeah i'm a bank robber i'm a career criminal i've been doing this my entire life and then we slowly okay. unravel this entire backstory with him uh with casey affleck's detective going after him yeah it, it's kind of remarkable I, I like i like how david is able to do that right get stories that are about honesty and about being transparent considering mm -hmm. your weaknesses your strengths um, and not just, um, you know, a stereotypical uh, person who does everything right. You're right. There is some layers to that, Sabrina. And I really enjoy that. 
and what he's able to accomplish with that. Speaking of Robert Redford, all right, favorite, uh, speaking of old Roberts, Robert De Niro or Robert Redford? Come on, man. Come on, man. How are you going to say Old people, hey. Roberts? Yeah, I mean, old I, Robs? Rob? Well, Do you have a thought, we, Rob? I'm <laughs> One day I'm going to be an old Rob. But yeah, but, one day you're going to be an old, old man. Yeah, old man Rob. Old, old man, man Rob. Mine. Yeah, with the with the with the blaster. Um, no, nah, I'm a uh, I'm gonna go with Robert De Niro on that one though, low key on the low, Damn. on the low low. Even though Robert Damn. Redford might be listening to this podcast right now. Yeah, I mean he's yeah. chilling. You know he's on vacation. He's, doing, he's retired. He's that. living life. I'll pick he's Robert Redford. I'll do it. I'll be brave. Yeah, Ooh, I'll pick him go. too. No, yeah. I'll one hundred percent pick him. I'm always. I haven't even been able to see like a large person his filmography, uh, but I'm always impressed and. I don't know, Robert De Niro, nothing against Robert De Niro, but his movies are just never something that I've been interested in. Like a lot of the like, oh. you know, we got like Goodfellas hey, and stuff hey, like on, that. Man, I don't yeah. Taxi I don't care about those. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> yeah. yeah, I'm like, I like them, but they're not like endlessly rewatchable for me personally. And also with this character, having Robert Redford play this like old man, because him and Casey Affleck, they're aware of each other. And he knows that he's like trying to solve this case. Yeah. And heat. they keep like he copied it from Robert De Niro. It's heat. <laughs> I'm hey, kidding. Uh, uh, <laughs> you know, I thought I was uh, going after uh, Al Pacino here. I was going on. I thought it was part of the mob. Yeah. No, I'm not doing a good Robert De Niro. That's my perfect. Bad. My bad. My bad. <laughs> I got to think that out more. I got to work on that one. Uh, sorry, Sabrina. Go ahead. Oh, no, I just love the way that it wraps up this character um, because it's the exact opposite of what we saw in The Green Knight. The Green Knight, he was able to make a good decision at the end. He literally gets out of he gets out of jail. He meets up with his lady, Sissy Spacek, uh, playing Jewel. He meets up with her. He's living on her farm. They would have like a chill, nice, comfortable life. And he just decides to lie and say that he's going to go run errands and rob four banks in a day, get caught by the cops with a smile on his face. It's just insane because he is a good person. He treats everybody around him like pretty well. But at the same time, he's not a good person because of stuff like this. So we see all different shades and facets of kind of like what it is to be a human because he's chummy with Casey Affleck. Uh, he's very, very great to Jewel. He tries to pay off like her mortgage uh, at her farm and stuff like that without her knowing. It's just, it's really, really interesting and complex, but I think this one's a really fun ride. This is a movie my dad would love. Out of all the David Lowry films that we talked about today, this is the one my dad would like. Uh, that is an amazing way to end our episode <laughs> on David Lowry. Uh, let us know what you guys think about his filmography. What is your favorite film of his? He already has a pretty established film career considering he is kind of young. Uh, I'm so excited to what he's, to see what he does next. Type on Titan. Um, I'm just playing guys. Uh, but either way, Sabrina, where can everyone find you? You guys can follow me on Twitter and Instagram at Sabrina X Monica, also on Twitter at Sabrina on Film. And if you want to see my non spoiler Green Knight review for any reason, it is up on the channel. Uh, RB3. You can follow me on Twitter and Instagram at Director RB3. Uh, I am at Squad Literates. Make sure you guys follow us at First Cut TMO. Also, like and subscribe if you haven't done so already. That is the best way to show us love. Thank you so much for watching, guys. And for the Meaning of Podcast, Peace you now. Peace.